Hello, everyone. Good morning. We're going to give a few minutes for some of our other attendees to join. So just hold on for a couple minutes. We'll get started in just a minute. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Emmanuel, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you well, Nate, hi. Great, great. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday, and welcome to today's webinar, CST Studio for Electronic Design for Signal and Power Integrity. My name is Nate Woodard, and I'm the Electromagnetics Business Development Manager here at Computer Aided Technology. And here at computer-aided technology, we have a passion for helping our clients across multiple simulation physics domains. And today we are very excited to discuss a powerful workflow within the CST Studio suite of electromagnetic solvers. So I will be your host today for the hour that we have scheduled. And shortly I'll be introducing our distinguished presenter, Emmanuel LaRoe from Dassault. Um, before we get started, I wanna go over a few things so you know how to participate in today's event. You'll have the opportunity to submit questions through the control panel. You can send questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I do have a few quick polls to get us started. So if you're already logged in and you see the poll, if you could go ahead and answer. Um, I've got another couple polls to um, Put up once uh, you're done with this poll. And let me go ahead and do that now. Emmanuel, um, I think I'll just run the polls in the background here as we get started. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Emmanuel LaRue, whose role at Dassault is Worldwide Industry Process Director with a focus on electromagnetics. Emmanuel, please take it from here. Thanks, Nate. Hi, everybody. Nice uh, to talk to you today. So we are going to talk about uh, signal and power integrity on treated circuit boards. Uh, first, I would like to ask some questions to you. Uh, do you have high-speed connections on your PCB? What is high-speed? We are going to talk more about it today, but the meaning here is uh, what kind of signal will spread on the PCB traces. Do we have all type of memories like DDR2 or do we have DDR3, DDR4? Do we have a speed uh, uh, USB signal? 
like uh, SATA, uh, PCI Express or USB. USB 3 is a quick one. Do you have power uh, part on your PCB? Do you need to basically convert the, uh, the power part basically uh, on your PCB? Do you have dense and shaped PCB? Or do you have difficulty uh, to encounter some regulations in your countries regarding electromagnetic compatibility? If uh, some of the answer is yes, then you need to simulate your PCB. So at the end of the day, you, it does not mean you need to simulate any PCB. Uh, if you have uh, something slow in terms of uh, rest time, uh, you don't need to simulate. So please ask your question, you, do you have high speed connections? Then I don't know if, uh, Nate, you have the answer of the pool because I would like to know the result to proceed. So 64% are validating PCB performance with signal and power integrity and then um, the remainder are doing both validation and uh, overcoming FCCT, FCC normative. Okay, I see. So it's interesting for me because it means that today um, most of you will have interest on what we will develop here in terms of signal and power integrity, but please stay tuned also for the last session with CATI we are going to run at the end of the month in July because we will talk also about FCC regulations, how to meet them. And what about the PCB layout? What kind of PCB layout our guests are using, Nate? Let me put that poll up, Emmanuel. And we'll give folks some time to uh, get their answer. Altium, Cadence, Mentor, or other as the option. Results are coming in. So the majority have responded. Emmanuel, two thirds are using Altium, and okay. the rest uh, Cadence and something else. Okay, so this is a good input for me because at that point I'm going to show you the new embedded uh, solution we have with Altium Designer. So I'm going to show one more slide at that point. Excellent. Thanks a lot. And so then Emmanuel, you have, we have one more poll question before we get started that I'll go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. So what is the biggest issue today that you have for PCB validation? I'll open the poll. There's a few options. I'll give another 30, 40 seconds for folks to respond. All right, we've got results coming in. So majority of people have responded. Emmanuel, about 40%. Um, the biggest issue is signal integrity, about 20% power integrity, and then uh, a third of the audience is all of the above. Okay. It sounds like they're in the right place. Yeah. Perfect, okay, so we can proceed. So I know now how to tune the presentation for you guys. So we are going to see in uh, what is the workflow uh, we, we can use with the CST Studio Suite uh, on-premise on the local machine and a community engineer on the Suite Experience platform on the cloud. So we have two solutions available and the both are available with all uh, the capabilities I'm going to develop today. So uh, I'm going to show you in which way we can import PCBs, how it's useful to, to run some design rule check 
before to make any simulation to discover that some rules have been violated, for example. Then I'm going to develop SI, then PI, and then I will show the advantage of running high performance computing on cloud. Feel free to ask your questions into uh, the chat. And Nate, if you see that you start to have several questions and I'm going to change um, the topic, for example, from SI, I go to PI, uh, you can stop me and uh, ask me the question already because it's nice to, to have answer the question as, as we are going on, okay? Absolutely. Great, so let's get started. So the workflow is the following. First, I need to tell you that before to simulate a post layout of your PCB, uh, it's important to ask you some basic questions. If you have high speed signals uh, at pre layout level, what you can do. In fact, sometimes you need to investigate some technology. Will I use my, uh, will I draw Will I route my uh, high speed signal through a strip line using micro strip or coplanar lines? What kind of via through all dimensions I'm going to use? So we have capabilities to help your design at the pre layout phase. Where are you going to place your component, the high speed component? Because placement of component on a PCB is a very critical issue. So before to come to a first post layout, I would say analysis, we have tools to help you to make nice technology investigation so that you make the right choice uh, for your placement. Then after we have a completely or partially routed PCB, we are going to input it into our system and we are going to make first of all, number three, a design rule checker to verify best practice rules for digital PCB. So it works for digital PCB. Huh? If you have analog RF or mix analog RF digital, you must go through the workflow letter. Huh? It works only for digital PCB, but still it's a very nice help for you before to simulate. Then we are going to discuss in the presentation today how I can uh, address a very nice KPI, which is the eye diagram. I'm going to explain what is the eye diagram meaning and how we can uh, obtain it for signal integrity. Then I'm going to, to show how we can simulate a so-called IR drop simulation to see if you have enough charges to feed all the integrated circuit of your PCB. And also I'm going to simulate the famous ground bounds where we see the power distribution network that is not always at zero logic. Sometimes it bounces each time you have a change of state of the digital signals. And we're going to see how you can optimize with decoupling capacitor. Then I want to, to give a, a, my end to my friend uh, and colleague Veran is going to talk to you in the uh, next session. So we have three sessions with CITI. Today it's SIPI, but Veran is going to tell you about thermal simulation of your PCB. Huh? next week and uh, the week after last week of july we will have me again uh, coming back about electromagnetic compatibility fcc limits so this is a bit the plan so let's get started here are the format you can import from your pcb so from altium designer we basically import the odb plus plus and from cadence we can read directly the dot brd file from allegro pcb loud system Please uh, note that we can input also from Mentor Graphics uh, a PCB expedition and board station files. And we can read also Zuken CR8000 format as well. Very nice is the new IPC2581, which is the new format neutral that is used in complement to ODB uh, to get the data. So if you are using other system like PCAD, CATSTAR, ORCAD, and so on, uh, it's enough that you can provide ODB++ file or IPC to, to get uh, the file into our system. Uh, once you are in, you will have an environment where you will see your PCB. You will have the possibility to address the part, the part uh, library and the nets. You will have a cross-section view where you will be able to see what is the cross-section uh, thickness what is the elevation of the traces, 
what are the physical properties of your dielectric? And if you have losses in your uh, conductive metal layers, then as you are using most of your Altium designer, I want to explain you a very nice workflow that is achievable if you choose the solution on the cloud. So basically, through the 3D Experience platform, we can connect the electronic designer with the uh, electromagnetic engineer. So basically, here we have from Altium the capability to connect to Altium designer and to run electromagnetic engineer solution directly on it so that the PCB is loaded automatically into the system. And you see here CST Studio that pops up. And ju just imagine you need to make some power integrity uh, analysis. So you basically uh, try to obtain uh, for a certain PCB what is the impedance that is seen as a certain observation point on the power distribution network. This is a, a curve here that you see with resonances in red. At those resonances, we are going to plot what is the impedance plot at this frequency. And basically, in red over there, it means that you don't have enough decoupling capacitor. So you send a notification to the PCB engineer that is going to make a modification. So the PCB guy is going to work and is going to add some decoupling capacitor where he knows he can place them because this is a job that has to be done by him. And you, as a simulation guy, what do you do? You just notify there is a change in the PCB layout and you just accept the modification. You have a variant of the PCB and you are going to accept the modification. Here you go. You have version one. Version one, and you just accept uh, to, to, to do basically a, mod, a, a simulation on the new PCB file. And what, what is great here is that you don't need to set the simulation again. Everything is ready for simulation. So you don't need, you know, to set all the scenario with the decoupling capacitor and all the work. It is the what if analysis. It brings the PCB designer and the electronic engineer to work together with the 3D experience platform. So here to do this workflow, you need to be able to do to use, I would say, the CST on the cloud, which is electromagnetic engineer. For your information, a similar workflow exists also with Cadence. And also Zuken implemented their own workflow uh, con connector. So this is a connector you need to buy on top. And it, it's, it's a very nice way to do mod sim, modeling simulation with electronic CAD. Imagine at that point that your PCB is, is uh, bended because you have a wearable application. So you want to bend it on a cylinder. As soon as you imported it, you have the capability in your solution to bend and to extend up to a certain limit your PCB. So here it's bended two times. And you see how it's easy to bend the PCB and to simulate the bended version of it, which is very nice. So remember, if you have wearable devices, you have to simulate the PCBs that come from a smartwatch on the arm of a guy. This is possible thanks to this bending feature I wanted to show you. Then let's now start making some design rule checking. My call here is the following. It's very important to look at how the layout has been made. So imagine uh, a guy wrote a, a net that is very near to the border of the PCB. And imagine you have a high speed signal over there. And it is routed through a microstrip. That means that you have ground layer, dielectric, and trace. Usually, you have a certain behavior of the electric field. We call it a quasi-transverse electric magnetic pattern because you have something like that that will basically uh, turn on, on on the metal plane. The problem is that uh, on one side you have a metal plane. On the other side, you don't have it because you are near the border. So it's not going to work. You are going to create common mode current on the ground plane. And it will lead to, to, to uh, a radiated emission at the end of the day. So it's not a good idea. So what we, we do basically with the design rules checking, we are going to tag the, the nets. You need to associate a specific signal 
on each of the high speed net. So you must say, for example, you have USB 3 on that net, you have DDR4 on that buses of parallel nets, for example. We are going to take components as well, and we don't do any simulation, we just run a screening of the PCB and we see if there are violations. Let's have an example. So you see there are several kinds of, of rules we can check. We can also check if you are running over a hole which is in the ground plane. And yet again, you have the return current that has to avoid the hole in the ground plane, which means you will have a transfer inductance that will create some radiated emissions. So basically, what we try to do, we look at and check. Let's have an example with the decoupling capacitor. So my call here is to see if I have decoupling capacitor on my PCB. On the left, you see a screening of the PCB that MEC with the design hole check. Several violations in blue are found. They are located here on the dotted line. By adding decoupling capacitor on the right place, I get rid of several of the violations. This kind of job takes you minutes. You should do that before to simulate because you are basically enhancing your design looking at the best practice. And here for that, we are really uh, using an amazing experience, um, uh, basically, of what uh, uh, the design rule check uh, on the digital PCB that has been found. So we have been working with very key leaders. Huh? I don't know if you heard about Bruce Archambault. Huh? He was working at the IBM in the past. And he had a great, great experience. And we are using also this to, to make it happen. Um, it's very nice. Then, after you did the design rule uh, check, we basically uh, make a signal integrity simulation. Before to do that, I need to explain what is high speed. And to explain what is high speed, I need to compare analog signal on top with digital signal in the bottom. Um, with analog signal, you see you have different value of the amplitude versus time. Uh, and with the digital signal, you have two solutions, zero logic, one logic. And the issue is that if you go with digital signal to broadband and to high speed, you get basically the issue which is the following. The, the rise time that is needed for the signal to, to commute between zero to one logic is slow down so that at the end of the day it creates overshoot and undershoot because you don't have the same impedance on your transmission line compared to the one at the input impedance of the um, receiver and so a wave is going to come back to your driver and you have the same issue at the driver again. So you have basically waves traveling there, uh, resulting in overshoot and undershoot. Of course, you are going to use clamp diode to limit this to a certain amount. But if it is very high, it's going to make your component change of state. And you should not. So we have really two issues, the mismatch on the impedance and also the fact that your signal is slowed down, so the rise time will have a tendency to, 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 to be slower. So of course, uh, how to test that? The, the, the technique we use is to send what we call a pseudo random bit sequence. That is a series of one and zero that will propagate on your transmission line, high speed. And we do what we do in Paris. You know, I'm, I'm French, so I like, if you go to Paris, you have the music, um, with accordion. You heard about the accordion, so the accordion which is developed is the pseudo random bit sequence that is sent at the driver's side. And the accordion that is compressed on one time bit, this is the I diagram. So you understand now, we are going to look at all the commutation on one time bit, and you see the rise time that is slowed down. And at the end of the day, the I diagram gets closed. And if the I diagram is closed, it means you cannot go at the speed you wanted. It means you need to slow down a little bit your requirement, not anymore 500 megabit per second, but only 200 megabit per second. So this is why this is the great KPI to simulate the high diagram to be sure you can certify your high speed connection. So uh, let's have a look with the demo. 
we are going to have a CPU U1 connected with a memory using a bus made of DDR3. And we are going, of course, to use a modeling of integrated circuit driver and receiver. Of course, the receiver on the memory will be on the quiet state. But on the, on the driver, we will have IBIS model to model, I would say, the output impedance of the driver. We are not going to use, you know, transistor level model that are far too heavy. Huh? We use this so-called IBIS uh, model that are, are existing, I think, from the year 96, if I'm not mistaken. I was taking part, by the way, in that time uh, to the first user forum of IBIS. I remember. Uh, so let's have a look to, uh, with the demo. So here is my PCB, and I concentrate on U1, and I take basically, first of all, the model I'm going to associate. So if I click on it, you see I have the capability to edit the model, and I can locate the correct IBIS model that uh, you can put here. Then, of course, I need to excite with a certain stimulus. And the stimulus uh, will tell me, uh, yeah, what kind of signal do I use to excite? So let's have a look to the stimulus. So I'm using a, a pseudo-random bit sequence, okay, PRBS at 1,066 MHz with a certain pulse width, with a certain duty cycle as well. And this is the signal that has, is going to spread from the driver side. Then on the receiver side, we are going to have quiet uh, status and see what is the result. Automatically on the schematic editor of, of our solution, the schematic is made automatically. It's very nice. And then uh, after you simulate, you obtain the so-called diagram that I mentioned before. And you can appreciate if it is open or if it is closed. And of course, you have the capability as well uh, to deep dive on some of the traces. So let's have a look now on, on the traces. And here you have the digital signal that spread on the traces. So let, let's take one signal, let's zoom on it. And here you see the overshoot of the digital signal. And you can appreciate, yes, it goes to 1.17 volt. It's still OK. It would not be okay if I go to 1.3 volt because I would change of state, right? So this is what I wanted to show you. But now we can go even further. In fact, what it is very nice is to appreciate what we call on top of the eye opening, the bit jitter. We can calculate the bit jitter and we can also simulate the bit error rate. That is what basically you need to obtain at the end of the day. But uh, to do that, sometimes, you know, you need your experience to look net by net what is happening. And if you have a DDR4 bus, you need to do that for all the nets. And it's a lot of work to verify, you know, that your signal and the eye diagram is uh, respecting the requirement. Alors what we did, we implemented an automatic workflow called DDR4 analysis that basically will take into account all your signal to be simulated, and you can then take a coffee and come back one year later, uh, one, one, one hour later, and what you get is a, a file that tell you if you have violations or not. If it is green passed, that means that your eye diagram you see here fit into the normative. So I did not put the normative here, but it, it means that, you know, you have a, a, a uh, respect of a mask. If you have a violation, then you, you have to look exactly only to this trace. So this is a very nice way to do DDR4 analysis to have the result in an automatic way. Then, of course, I want to add further information. We can also uh, accept the newcomer of the kind of IBIS model called IBIS IMI because you know, IBIS had some limitation and people decided to make an enhancement and also uh, take into account uh, decodification. So this is possible as well. And maybe some of you are working with specific uh, 
uh, integrated circuit where your vendor is giving you H spice. You know, H spice is an analog simulator from Synops Synopsis. They, you can get for free sometimes some encrypted model, encrypted H spice model, and it is good also to use them because they are very accurate. And if, if you have them available, it's good to use them. So now the good news in the new version is that we have a macro that converts, you know, the encrypted model so that they, are, they can be consumed by our design studio, DES, which is our circuit simulator. So this is what I wanted to tell you. I mean, we now completed all, all what we needed to do great SI simulation. So at the end of the day, we can really make broadband analysis. We can get to a key KPI like bit error rate and a diagram. We have automatic check for DDR4 so that you don't need to do it yourself and check one by one. And we have a good accurate, accurate, uh, accurate prediction. That's all for the integrity. Alors, there are some questions I can answer. Emmanuel, no questions yet, but um, okay. everyone remember that you can ask a question in the questions panel on the control panel. So we proceed with uh, um, power integrity. Alors why do we need to do a power integrity simulation? I remember 20 years ago when I started with this kind of simulation, all simulator was taking the hypothesis that the metal plane was zero logic. If you use SPICE, for example, uh, the, the, the ground plane, GND, is zero logic. That means that you don't take into account at all the power distribution network, the PDN. And the more we went with high speed over those years, means that you need to take into account the PDN. And uh, why? Because each time you are going to change state, imagine you have here a nice example, you have a voltage regulator module v, uh, VRM and you have some uh, components. Each time the components that will change of state, you, they need charges. So you need to provide at the VCC and ground pin, you need to provide immediately some charges in order to allow a good commutation of the driver. If you have to wait from the voltage regulator to bring you those charges, going through the VCC and ground plane with all the holes on the VCC and ground plane, it will take forever. So you need to place very near decoupling capacitor to be sure that you don't have this phenomena that is, count, that is called VCC bounce. You see here, at 40 nanoseconds, I have a change of state and I have, unfortunately, noise on the VCC. My VCC should be at 1.8 volt, which is a low voltage uh, system. And uh, at a certain point, I go to 2.5. It should not be because it will have the effect of a bad signal integrity. So it will have an effect on the signal integrity as well. And it will create some radiated emissions, because if you connect the cable, a shielded cable, for example, at the extremity and connect it to the ground plane, the cable will act as antenna and you will have those peaks when you have to do the FCC check in an echoic chamber. So you, ne you need to make those simulations. So we have two kinds of analysis we can do. The first is in DC, in continuous. It means we just check if you have enough, uh, I would say, a current to, to, to drive your uh, integrated circuits that are located far away. And this simulation is basically a basing uh, ohmic law simulation, U equal to Ri, very easy stuff, but you need to do it to show that you have enough, I would say, charges to drive all your device. Second is in dynamic, we make things switches, and we have the analysis of the decoupling capacitor. Let's have a look first on the IR drop. So the PCB has been imported, and you have to say, I would say, what are the capabilities of your uh, battery or uh, alimentation, uh, so at the connector site. 
and you have to say for each of the IC pins, what are the SIC capability of those pins? How much they can get from the distribution network? And you simulate and you see, you have nice graphs that show you basically that in red, you have a high level of voltage. In green or even in blue, you have a too low level of voltage. That means that if you are far away from the connector, you may not have enough charges to feed your device. So you need to make some modification. This is higher drop. And this is also interesting because my colleague Viran will use it as an input, as a heat source in the thermal simulation he will do in one week for you in the next CATI event. PA analysis in dynamic is something else. I put myself at a certain point on the PDN, so I don't care anymore about the, 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 the PCB signal traces. I just get rid of them and I keep only the ground and VCC nets with the VR. So I make a simplification of the PCB and it can be nicely done inside our solution. And we calculate the impedance that is seen at a certain observation point. So what you get is some kind of uh, impedance plot with resonances. Of course, we are going to take into account of all the capacitors that are available on your PCB. And you, we need to take into account also of the intrinsic parasitic value for the capacitors, because the capacitor is not a capacitor at high frequency. You have a, a, its own inductance and resistor. We call it ESR and ESL, resistance inductance. And if you take them into account, you see that the peak I was talking about before is not that huge as, as we fear. So you, you really need to take into account a realistic value of decoupling capacitor, in, including resistance series and, uh, um, and inductance series. For each of the peaks, you need to deep dive and plot what we call an impedance spatial map, where you see in red, the ground bounce is happening. I am moving each time I'm switching. So I need to place decoupling capacitor here and there. And you don't have to do it yourself alone because we have a great tool, which is called decap tool. What does it do? It takes as an input the dotted grid line, which is the target you want to achieve. You would like to have this kind of transfer impedance of the PDN power distribution network without any uh, resonance that is above this dotted line. Then you take into account all the capacitors. So this is your target. Uh, you take into account all the capacitors that are embedded in your device. And of course, you can also read what I would call the bill of material. That is to say, all the parts that your company is able to purchase from vendors. So you have a list, of course, of impedance with value. And as I said, not only the inductance, but you need also the value of resistance because we need to have an accurate value for the decoupling capacitor. Then what you see here is the price. And this is a great information because, in fact, what we are going to do here is an optimization based on uh, playing with the capacitors that are the cheapest one and we are trying to use as less decoupling capacitor as possible to reach the green dotted line. So the optimizer is going to make several try up to the point that he use, uh, he converge. So this is a multi-objective optimization where I optimize the impedance in green and the price. So at the end of the day, what you get is a good solution from the engineering point of view, but you are using less decoupling capacitor and you are using the cheapest one. So this work, I would say, with capacitors that exist in your company and that are placed at the position you are set on your project. 
Of course, you can also add physically new decoupling capacitor. And this is what I did with the Altium PCB in the uh, ModSIM uh, demo I did in the beginning. You remember in the video I showed before, I was asking my colleague to add new decoupling capacitor. And of course, you can do that as well. So you can work at several levels, I would say. And at the end of the day, you get a flat uh, impedance for this frequency where you had a peak. So it's a very, very nice feature. I see there are some questions, please. Emmanuel, we have a question in the chat. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Please, please, please say the question. It's better that I stay like this. Yeah, yeah, please. Is there any tool to compute transmission light impedances and optimize the stack up and pre layout analysis? I think yes, we have. Very good question. Yep. You can impose your kind of transmission line, coplanar, strip line, micro strip, and also other kind. Okay. Um, you have some kind of a static editor. And you uh, can optimize, you can put, you know, a certain KPI as a target for your optimization, and you parameterize the thickness and the epsilon value, and it will work for you at pre-layout level. Is there another question? That's it for now. Okay, so Thank you. as you can see, uh, we are talking not only about power integrity, but price as well, <laughs> because we do multi-domain uh, analysis optimization. Uh, we can consume layout from third-party authoring tool. And I would say that we have a great in integration with Cadence and Altium. Ah, it's great, because these are the system most of you are using. That means we don't just work at post layout level we work also at pre layout first first point second point we also can allow you to make what if analysis working with your pcb layout expert good so now what i want to mention is hpc on cloud because let's imagine you have this monster over there it's a pcb that has uh, many uh, nets and it's made also of two PCBs that are connected together. So it's a very, very big PCB. Imagine it has 30 layers. It's a monster. And imagine, you know, the, the, what I explained you now, uh, SI, PI, we are using, I would say, 2D and 3D approach to do that. We are not doing it in full 3D as we should do for electromagnetic compatibility. If you take a PCB like that and maybe you insert an electrostatic gun discharge nearby, or you want to take into account and calculate the radiated emissions, then you have no other way to use a time domain full wave 3D solver. And in that case, it can be really very, very uh, heavy simulation. You have 43 million of mesh cells. So if I simulate it on my computer at home, I need with six core, four hours. But if I use uh, the capability to run on the cloud, and this, is, it, this can be done automatically, you don't need to send your job to rescale. Come on, you just buy electromagnetic engineer and you have embedded some power on cloud. And here, basically, what you have is capability to save time, uh, really, to save time with, uh, from four hours, uh, you have one hour, 43 minutes. And uh, if you even accept to pay a bit more, uh, because with electromagnetic engineer, you have to 16 core included, but you can buy more uh, with a Simulia, Simunit token of credits. Alors, with... Uh, if, you, if you accept, in fact, to, to buy more core and to run on GPUs, because our solvers are running on GPU, especially the time domain solver I'm talking about here now, you come to 23 minutes. 
So you know what it means? It means that we are simulating uh, two PCBs with a full wave three D solver, okay, taking into account radiated emission, 43 million mesh cells with 24 core for GPU. It takes 23 minutes. This is extremely uh, quick for a project that a few competitors are capable to run because here we really run it with all the effects. All the effects are taken into account. Yes, that's all from my side. So is, do you have some questions, Nate? I do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one question came through. Are the SI and PI solvers an additional purchase on top of CST? Very good question. No, they are not. So basically, a CST or electromagnetic engineer, huh, this is the same. They come with, of course, the well-known time domain and frequency domain solver, as well as asymptotic or method of moments that are useful for antenna and RF system. But you get as well the SI uh, in time domain, SI in frequency domain, if you like to get as parameter of, of uh, high speed uh, um, interconnects and also the PI solvers are all included into the package. That means that for the same package, you can do antenna, you can do SI, PI, electromagnetic compatibility, and also thermal of the PCB. It's all included in the package. Great, thank you. And then another question that came through, what file can I import if the PCB layout system I am using is not giving me ODB++ or IPC files? Good question, Nate. Here, we have this question from time to time. And here, there is no other way to come back to Gerber. Gerber remains anyway very used for connecting with manufacturing. And we have capability, I would say, to import layer by layer. So we have basically what we use here is we have a, a cross-section editor that allow you to import layer by layer the 2D Gerber file. And in this cross-section editor, you will be asked to insert yourself. Huh? It's editable. You will be able to insert the thickness, the elevation, the, the conductivity, sigma, the uh, permeability, epsilon, and you have to do it yourself at that point. And of course, for a complex PCB, you will need to import also the via all file because uh, of course, the layers are connected together with via all. So we have a way to uh, import that as well. So it's a bit more uh, cumbersome. <laughs> you will need maybe with the, this editor two or three hours of work, but it works. It works and we are able to rebuild from Gerber's the PCB in our environment and to save it as a tech file so that you don't need to do the work again next time. Great, thank you. And one more question came through and I think you were right in the middle of talking about um, HPC and, and SIM unit credits and tokens, but I don't know if there's anything more to elaborate on how can I accelerate my simulations? Yeah, right. So basically, it depends. If you have, for example, one uh, uh, GPU from NVIDIA that is uh, on your uh, hardware available and you want to use it, it's very easy because with five SRU, which is the uh, simulation token, uh, new concept of Simulia, you can activate one GPU. So of course, with one GPU, you will start to speed up a lot your simulation. So my advice would be, especially for PCB, is to use the power of the GPU because um, it gives you a very good speed up without spending too much uh, tokens. And it works also with the thermal solver. So we have a conjugated heat transfer a solver that is really a real CFD code that will take into account radiation conduction and natural and forced convection. Uh, and here it can run on GPU as well. So the, I would say I would really invest on one GPU connected with your hardware, okay? Or if you don't have that every day and you, you need to make a peak of work, for example, you have a peak of work once every uh, two months, and uh, but you need a very, very 
high demand in one week. Then you can buy what we call simulation sim credit that you are going to consume in one week. Uh, they are called SUN, and this is a great option on cloud uh, to allow to access to our great uh, cloud system at Dassault system. And here you get basically uh, the, your time, uh, your simulation time uh, to get down uh, drastically. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. So I think, yep, that does it for all of our questions today. So with that said, I want to thank you, Emmanuel, and thank everyone for attending today's webinar. I also want to remind everyone to register for the next two webinars in this three-part series. So next Wednesday, July 20th, we will be presenting the PCB thermal cooling workflow. One of Emmanuel's colleagues will be doing that. And then Emmanuel will be back with us on Thursday, July 28th to discuss simulating electromagnetic compatibility. So please register. If you have any questions about what we presented today, please reach out to me. And thanks again for joining today and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.